Well, thank you for joining us this afternoon. I hope you had a good lunch. And um, we're very happy to be here and discuss diversity in data. Just to understand a little bit who is in the audience, would you give us a show of hands who of you is working in software engineering or is involved in data science? All right. Oh, wow. <laughs> That's about half of it. Thank you. Um, diversity is a hot topic anyway, no matter where you look at it from. Um, from your personal perspective, diversity has many different facets. What do you think is, or for you personally, which is the most important facet of diversity for you? Yeah, so um, firstly, very thrilled to be here um, and talking to all of you. And, and uh, Britta, you know, diversity has multiple connotations, as you, as you rightly pointed out. It's ensuring that you, know, you are being inclusive in the way that you think about your product, your product design. Many of you are software engineers and data scientists. And it's, so it's critical to ensure that you know, you're defining a product that's actually being built that can service different stereotypes and, and different types of customers. Mm -hmm. Okay. I mean, yeah, if you look at diversity, you, you have the facets of, of course, we have gender, we have ethnicities, we have religion, we have different backgrounds. How does it all play? Um, what role did it play in your life? What experience did you have? Yeah, so, uh, Britta, you know, there's some statistic that's out there. Those of you that are wondering, you know, why is diversity and inclusion such a big deal when it comes to product design and software engineering? There are actually proven studies that show that you know, the, the efficacy of your product and the productivity of your organization goes up. And, and the metric says 48% if you incorporate gender diversity and something like 40% if you incorporate diversity along other facets, right? such as ethnicity, nationality, um, sexual orientation, and things of that nature. So statistics apart, you know, there is actually a lot of merit. There are very good business reasons why you need to incorporate diversity in the way that you do product design. Mm -hmm. I mean, you started your career in software engineering, Radhika, um, a few years ago. <laughs> what changes did you see with regard to diversity that came about since you started as a software engineer? How's I think the developing? biggest, uh, that's a great question, right? Because software engineering itself, as many of you know, you know, especially those that have been around uh, a couple of decades, know that software engineering has evolved dramatically in the last, last few decades, right? And, and so in particular, if you think about you know, constructs like uh, AI and ML and the impact that it has on outcomes, um, in the society in terms of decision making that happens that are being influenced by AI and ML, um, I think that's probably by far the, the biggest transformation that has taken place. Okay. Well, you were just mentioning AI. This is also coming into our everyday lives. And um, we as um, people, we face different challenges. I mean, climate change is coming. We have a growing population on the Earth that we need to solve how we feed them in the future. We have educational, we have financial divides that are growing bigger. Can you give us a few positive examples where software engineering has helped to increase diversity and the approach and has helped um, um, different projects to create a success story? Yeah, well, I'm, I'm actually going to start with the not so great stories, Britta, so that it, it kind of brings home the, the point around what success really looks like, right? Um, many of you may know this, but AI and ML are playing into every aspect of our life, right? You know, these decision-making software is determining, you know, whether your child gets into a, a specific college, uh, whether you're able to land a job, uh, you know, what kind of advertisements you get when you're shopping online. Uh, it determines, you know, the propensity for you to get picked up, you know, uh, the uh, video surveillance cameras, etc. the likelihood of you being identified as somebody that is, you know, a high-risk individual. Um, on and on and on and on, right? Your loan applications, so on and so forth. So there are multiple aspects, multiple facets that are getting determined uh, through the use of AI and ML. 
And there are countless stories which, you know, again, that have transpired that we should all learn from. Uh, many of you may or may not recall this, but Amazon actually had a, a, a job resume filtering application based on AI and ML that would essentially was built off of historical data of successful Amazon employees, which, surprise, surprise, happened to be predominantly male. And so this resume filtering application would categorically look for anything that alluded to a, a, a women's college or a women's sport and filter out all those resumes, right? And, and so now you have this very uh, tricky situation where you know, you're, you're propagating a uh, you know, like essentially an all-male environment. Now, luckily, Amazon was able to flag it sufficiently ahead and, and was able to address some of those biases. But that's just one example of where you, know, you can either be operating with a poorly defined algorithm or a poorly defined data set, and you could end up with a system that is actually making incorrect recommendations. Now, one other example that's also at the scary end of the spectrum is where you know, autonomous driving vehicles have been predominantly, you know, especially in frontal crashes, have been designed for you know, the male body, right? And, and, and so you know, when these systems are, are, you know, when these frontal crashes happen to women uh, or people that are you know, like just have a different genetic uh, disposition or, or a body disposition, it ends up having you know untoward uh, uh, developments. And so you know the the point of this is you can actually design a system that is uh, that can lead to undesirable consequences, potentially life endangering consequences. And so it is critical that you know AI be applied the right way. Now I'll get to the question that you asked, which is. You know, what is an example of a story that is a success story? Um, you know, we, uh, the, a part of my employer works, uh, you know, we're, we're headquartered out of Japan. You know, lots of bullying happening in middle schools in Japan. And so there's actually an uh, a AI model that has been built out that can proactively identify bullying behaviors, right? Especially, you know, that, that are up in social media and they can nip it in the bud. And so this is um, you know, where there were like rise of suicides among middle schoolers. You know, that trend has actually been clamped down because of the way that uh, the AI has been implemented. So some really great stories. I think there's a ton of potential. The key is to ensure uh, the model that you build uh, incorporates that diversity. That, that is a wonderful project that you just mentioned. I'd like to go back to the, um, to the automotive, because I have a history in, uh, in the automotive business. And I know about the trolley dilemma. So how can we solve this? I mean, there's a lot of um, software going into the cars, into the autonomous driving cars. And um, how can we teach the software to make a decision like a human would make it? Yeah, believe it or not, uh, it turns out that the best way to inject diversity in your models is by not having a homogenous group design it. Um, <laughs> so, uh, you know, really it comes down to ensuring that, you know, the group that's doing the product design, the software design, um, actually mirrors the end customer as well. And it triggers the, the ability to have discussions that go, you know, what if or why have we not captured this demographic? Uh, and so that is a key first step, Britta, is just making sure that you have diversity in your teams. Uh, the second thing I would say is, you know, this, this notion of explainable AI, right? Uh, not designing systems that are black boxes that, you know, no one can rationalize, right? I think it's, it's critical that, that that be a, a, what is referred to as explainable AI, and, and that in turn results in what you can what people refer to as responsible AI, right? Which is, you know, the right things happen and the right decisions get made. Mm -hmm. Talking about right decisions, I think there's also an application for smart farming where um, AI can support. Can you elaborate on this a little bit? Oh yes, uh, there are multiple applications, you know, that that come through from uh, AI, and and some of these are fairly interesting. I think the one that you're referencing in particular is 
what we refer to as a better banana. Um, and so, you know, uh, believe it or not, there is banana farming that happens where, you know, you actually have the ability to optimize the environment and, you know, do the right type of water irrigation and so on, leveraging AI techniques. Um, later today, we're going to be talking about, you know, the, the opportunity to minimize uh, logging. You know, there's obviously a lot of focus around sustainability, minimizing our carbon footprint and so on. There are very many environmental applications that benefit from, from AI, right? And in particular, we're going to be talking about how you can leverage bioacoustics data from the Amazon rainforest. And you, know, you can apply AI techniques to it to figure out whether you know, there is the risk of logging that is likely to occur. Yeah. Or if a particular species uh, is you know, to the point of extinction, right? So I, there's just huge number of applications that, that straddle all aspects of this. Yeah. I, I think it's so important, Radhika, that we have examples like the smart farming or the rainforest um, to tell to the, to the world and to people who are not in software engineering, who are not working in data science, because I know a lot of people, one of my friends, he loves bananas, but he doesn't like AI. I mean, it, when he hears AI, it's like Terminator, Doomsday. But if he heard about an application where AI really helps him to get his bananas on the breakfast table, um, he would have a different look on, on uh, the possibilities that we have with software engineering. So when we talk about diversity in data, who is responsible for integrating diversity in data? What do you think? I mean, there's so many different groups involved in creating applications. Is it the responsibility of all of them or of a certain group? Is it leadership? I think it's everybody's responsibility, seriously. Um, I know the regulatory uh, governance around AI is just emerging, right? You know, there are obviously uh, government mandated requirements that are, you know, fairly nascent today. And so in the interim, I think it's incumbent on every one of us uh, to ensure that what we're building is truly responsible AI. Right. I mean, if we look at it from a global point of view, do you see any differences in how diversity in data is implemented on a global scale? Do we have countries that are um, embracing it more and faster than other countries? What's your um, view on this? Yeah, I think it's fair to say that Europe is maybe a little bit further ahead uh, than the Americas and, and Asia Pacific. But in general, I don't, the, the area is still, you know, it's, it's evolving, it's emerging, and I think given the very wide-ranging ramifications and implications of this, um, its regulation is, is going to be pretty challenging, and I think we'll, we'll continue to be work in progress for the, for the near future. Right. I was thinking, and um, I'd be interested in learning your opinion on this, Radhika. Looking at the pandemic, you know, companies have gone to remote work and in including employees from different locations. Doesn't this help us also to increase diversity in data because we're employing people that are maybe not local to our place but are come from different areas and then have a different vantage point on things? Yeah, I, I think those of us in software engineering already know this COVID pandemic has dramatically changed the way that you know, I, you identify, you onboard, you, you reskill, and, and the way that you develop talent. And for sure, uh, Britta, I think that is leading to certain opportunities where, um, you know, the hybrid mode allows us to be able to recruit talent uh, that we would otherwise not have gone after. Uh, I think it's a great opportunity, really, for everybody in software engineering to take advantage of and to ensure that not only that diversity in gender, but, but also across the other aspects get reflected in the way that, that teams get built out. Yeah. So if we imagine that you'd be speaking at Collision uh, next year again, <laughs> what would you like to be able to report on? What applications would you love to see to come into the market in the next year? I think it would be great to be able to come back with more success stories, right? And, and there are, you know, to be fair, there are very many out there. Uh, but I think a lot of this comes about from institutionalizing that knowledge, having some structure behind it, having some rigor to it, 
and then we talked about things like regulation and so on. But I think it's incumbent on the software engineering industry to A, recruit for diversity, and B, ensure that you know, the, the models and the software and the products that we build reflect and capture that diversity as well. So that's what I, I think it would be wonderful to be able to get back in here and talk about you know, how some of those metrics have, have gotten better in the past year. Right. And speaking about regulation, Radhika, how should we go about this? Does it have to be um, a government initiative? Can it be a nonprofit organization that drives this? Who would be best suited to drive the regulation in this field? Yeah, there are a, a few nonprofit organizations that have started to uh, you know, really get very active in the space. And I, you know, as with any other topic, uh, I think it's critical to ensure that we uh, embrace and support these nonprofit organizations. You know, governments can only go so far, and, and sometimes it tends to be a sledgehammer approach. Um, and so, you know, I would say it needs to be the collective responsibility for all of us in software engineering with those NGOs to ensure the right things happen. Okay. So as we're wrapping up this session, uh, what kind of advice would you like to give to the audience or maybe a call to action when it comes to diversity in data? What can everybody contribute to it? Yeah, so the, the primary thing I would say is uh, try not to build homogenous teams. Uh, you know, much as it is easier to onboard those teams and get them ramped up and get them skilled up to the extent that you are actually able to inject diversity upfront it actually serves you well as, as you go through the process. Uh, the second thing I would say is, you know, be receptive to uh, input that might not allow you to get your product out quickly in the market. It's very temp tempting, and I say this out of you know, my own experience, to be able to declare success, you know, particularly with AI and ML, with data sciences in general, as we all know, you know, the da data set and the models need to be trained and retrained over a period of time. And so uh, while it's, it's, it's easy to claim success, I think it's critical to ensure that the models are getting tested against a fairly heterogeneous set of uh, targets. And therefore, you can step back and say, yes, I mean, this truly meets the objectives that you intended to achieve in the first place. So, you know, I would just say keep your mind open and then the third would really be around this concept of, you know, white box AI or explainable AI. Make sure that, you know, if, if, if you move on, that somebody is able to step in and understand what has been done there. Wonderful. Thank you so much for joining us on stage. Thank you for um, attending the session and keep the diversity in the data. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>